Hey, Visa, I got all the wrong shit on. Hey, and welcome to Collection Connection, the game that's just an excuse to talk about records. It's every Monday and Thursday, except for when it's not. I play this game with my brother, Plastic Eric, from the Plastic Soundwave Cult channel. Uh, you can follow along and play along with us by subscribing to both channels. On Eric's last round, he gave me the Grease soundtrack, the motion picture soundtrack from 1978. Uh, we've been doing this thing inadvertently at first where we've been pinging back and forth between 1978 and 1984 releases, which happens to coincide with the years that we left the U.S. to uh, go to England, our family, uh, our military family, for six years, and the summer of 84 when we came back. Greece was a significant album for us. It, have, it was the family's copy that Eric held up there. Uh, he's the one who's in possession of it now, but it was sort of general property when we were kids. And it was just before, he mentioned, it was just a couple of weeks before we left that he got to go see Greece. And I seem to remember even being in San Diego on our farewell tour when they went to go see it. So it really was shortly before we left. I, however, was deemed too young to see it. I'm two years younger than my brother. And I was so bent out of shape over this decision that uh, I still walk a little funny to this day. I tried to think of another John Travolta film soundtrack that spawned multiple uh, huge mega singles, included at least one number one US hit single that was written by Barry Gibb, but not performed by the Bee Gees, and was nominated for a 1979 Album of the Year, uh, but lost. And I came up empty, because of course Saturday Night Fever won that Grammy, so. There's hardly any connection to be had there. All joking aside, what this makes me want to talk about is Top of the Pops. Now, if you're in the U.S., you may not know Top of the Pops was a weekly uh, chart countdown that aired on BBC One on Thursdays in England. Uh, it ran from 1960-something to 2000-something, uh, 2006. But it was in full swing while we were in England, and we found it almost immediately. And the reason was because uh, You're the One That I Want was the number one single in the land. And for me, it felt like getting my hands on contraband. I had just weeks before been deemed too young to experience the film. And the videos were basically just the clips from the movie. And it was fantastic. So I finally felt like I got to see a little bit of the movie that I wasn't supposed to see and enjoy the songs. And we became regular viewers of Top of the Pops right from the get-go, right from moving there because the Grease soundtrack kept throwing song after song, uh, like uh, Grease, the title track, which is the song that was sung by Frankie Valley but uh, written by Barry Gibb. And You're the One That I Want, and Hopelessly Devoted to You, and, uh, gosh, what was the other big one? Summer Nights. And these songs dominated the charts for the first six months that we were there. And so we kept viewing, we kept watching, even after leaving, uh, even after that filtered out of the charts. And was a real building block on my own personal uh, take on music. You can probably tell <laughs> if you're familiar with the channel at all. And what I wanted to do for my connection then was a personal connection, but I did find a statistical connection that makes it a little bit uh, stronger. And that is based around a song and it's the charts. I mean, Top of the Pops just kind of laid out the charts for us. But uh, You're the One That I Want was number one in the middle of a nine-week run at number one on the UK charts when we moved to England. 
And at the time that we left, there was another song that was in the middle of a nine-week run at number one. And that song was Two Tribes, and the band is Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I'm not going to hold up the album just yet, because I'm going to be talking about Welcome to the Pleasure Dome as if I own Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, but I do not and have never owned Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, the first Frankie Goes to Hollywood album. What I do have is Bang! The Greatest Hits of Frankie Goes to Hollywood. This is something that I bought on CD because I didn't want to buy <laughs> Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. I bought Liverpool, their second album, on cassette at the time that it came out. And don't let uh, history fool you. It's a good album. It's a better album, in my opinion, than Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. Uh, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome was a double album for a debut, which is bizarre. And the over-the-top kind of bloat and indulgence of the record was almost the point of the record. But I don't know that that holds up into great music. Um, but I liked Liverpool enough that even though I thought that this was going to be enough to kind of sate my uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood hankering, I still ended up, when they reissued uh, a remaster of Liverpool, I went ahead and picked that up on CD, uh, in part because uh, Watching the Wildlife, which is one of the songs on here, was issued in a single format that is far inferior to the album mix uh, which is the only way to go if you're going to listen to Watching the Wildlife. And so, anyway, Frankie Goes to Hollywood seemed to be nihilistic in their output, especially for that first album, but not the kind of nihilism that leads to fighting, the kind of nihilism that leads to hedonistic orgies. Uh, they seemed very... Even for a party band, for a party sound that a lot of that had, um, were very sort of militant. You see, the this thing appeared on the in the inset of the uh, debut album, and it's I don't know, got a very kind of uh, Russian feel to it, and very militaristic uh, as a logo. Relax had hit number one in the early part of 1984, uh, but it had been banned, so we didn't really hear a whole lot of it. We just heard that it was uh, outrageous, not unlike Darling Nikki, which I talked about uh, last time with the Purple Rain soundtrack. But Relax was the only thing that's really hit hard, I think, in the US. Uh, meanwhile, this thing just kept chugging along in the UK and Two Tribes was just as big, if not bigger, a single than Relax was. And in the summer, uh, it was enough of a big hit that in the summer of 1984, Relax started making its way back up the charts. And I uh, will remember forever that the week that we left, uh, Relax had climbed up to number two on the charts so that Frankie Goes to Hollywood had the number one and number two spots on the singles chart, which had only been achieved by, uh, I believe, the Beatles and then John Lennon after he was killed. So it was quite, a, they were just an enormous phenomenon in England in 1984, and they pitched up another couple of hits uh, from this album. Um, but speaking significantly, so we're talking about a band that released two albums in total, the second of which was considered basically a flop even though, as I mentioned, it's a much better album than you'd think, and, and I believe it's, it's the better album of the two. It's got a little bit more restraint on it, which I think it benefits from, which is not to say that, <laughs> that it is a pulled back, restrained record, but in comparison to the debut, the sprawl, the double album sprawl of the debut, it is definitely a more restrained record. But again, as a band that had two albums, one of which left a meteor-sized impression in the ground and the other one which uh, didn't. The Greatest Hits is contains a good, good chunk 
of Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. I think it's got nine of the tracks from Welcome to the Pleasure Dome on it, and in itself gets rid of a fair amount of the bloat. Um, there's some weird covers on that first album. War, you're like, okay, that works. It's on brand. They do a little something with it. Not too bad. The cover of Born to Run, hmm, okay. You know, a little counterintuitive, but all right, it kind of works. Um, very Cross the Mersey. You got Jerry and the Pacemakers. Uh, I'm thinking, no thanks. And then a cover of Do You Know the Way to San Jose? They're going to do a Bacharach and David song. Uh, that's really just no. <laughs> so um, some of those are included on here, but there's they're some odd choices. Actually, I think three of the four of those are included on here, but we don't have to put up with Do You Know the Way to San Jose on the greatest hits. And this brings up one last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, whether my brother and I had a conversation recently uh, about the, the, the grammatical finickiness of greatest hits versus singles versus best of. Uh, to me, this should have been called uh, the best of Frankie Goes to Hollywood and not the greatest hits of Frankie Goes to Hollywood because it basically all the singles they ever released plus some stuff. <laughs> so to me, the singles is the singles. It's all of them. Greatest hits implies we had so many great singles that we had to call down and just get the best of them. The, the biggest chart scores of them all. And best of, to me, gives you free reign to just put the stuff that you like best on. The things that your audience uh, knows and the things that you think that they should know. So I think this is a bit of a misnomer, the greatest hits of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, bang. But it served for a while as, as the only Frankie Goes to Hollywood that I owned. I listened to the, the 13 minutes of the title track, or yeah, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. And who does that not need to be 13 minutes? But again, I think that was just kind of the point. But as much as they hit the zeitgeist at the time, uh, by the time just a few years had passed and Liverpool came on and they had that kind of Stone Roses syndrome of follow up the second album, Curse, uh, people just weren't as interested anymore, even though they tried to amp up the politics and uh, amp down. Amp down doesn't make a lot of sense, but you get what I'm saying? Uh, the, the naughtiness, uh, people just didn't care that much. But one last plug for it, Liverpool, it's a better album than you think. Um, so anyway, that is my connection, personal connection, the song that was number one uh, when we got to England, You're the One That I Want, and the song that was number one when we left England, which was Two Tribes, and the more statistical, uh, you can sink your teeth into it, connection being that both singles were on a nine-week run at number one in the UK charts. So I will pass that to Eric. Uh, hopefully he'll enjoy it. I still think Relax is a banger as much as it's been made fun of. Relax is a great fucking tune. Um, everything else I think I prefer from Liverpool. But there you go. Eric, anybody else? Uh, we're talking about Frankie Goes to Hollywood. You can make a connection to that uh, from something in your own collection. And Eric will be back with his response on Monday. So until then... Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.